Hi there, welcome to our unit on organic chemistry. This is actually the last unit of our chemistry year. So this is going to be the last time that we go to the course organization presentation and see where we are in the grand scheme of things. You probably know where we are by now. Let's go check it out. So remember, uh, I'm sure you probably remember, that our theme for the year has been that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And in the first part, we looked at collections of matter, and then we went in and we looked at the atom in the second part. Then we looked at what happens when we put atoms together in the third part. Here in our last part, we've been looking at four different examples of interesting ways that atoms interact. We started with a look at solutions and solution chemistry, and then we went and took a look at acids and bases. And our last unit dealt with electrochemistry and the production of electricity from chemical systems. Here at the end, we're going to do a brief introduction to a field of chemistry known as organic chemistry. And we'll talk about what all that means. We'll look at some organic reactions and then we'll call it a year. Sound good? I hope so. All right, let's go back to the presentation. So our organic chemistry unit is gonna start with the just a general introduction to organic chemistry. And I thought there was no better way to start than with uh, this picture of our mascot for the year. You've seen her at the beginning and end of every video. And this is Olive my French Bulldog. And I, I put Olive here because Olive is made out of organic molecules, and the carpet that she's sitting on is also made out of organic molecules. So she was as good a poster child as anything here for this introduction to organic chemistry. This term organic is a little bit weird. It's uh, used a lot in the popular media to mean basically natural or good for you a lot of times. That's not what we mean when we talk about organic chemistry. What we're talking about is we're talking about the study of compounds that contain carbon and how those compounds function. Carbon's really an interesting atom for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is that it's tetravalent. And what we mean by that is that it has four valence electrons, which means that it can form up to four covalent bonds with any other atoms that are around it. Here you see a very simple organic molecule, methane, and you can see that that carbon atom has formed bonds with four different hydrogen atoms. You can connect carbon to hydrogen, you can connect it to oxygen, you can connect it to nitrogen, you can connect it to other carbons. And so you start to get a huge diversity of organic molecules. How diverse? Well, check this out. So here is a pie chart that roughly shows you the number of organic versus inorganic compounds. So here's inorganic compounds. There are about a million that have been known and described by chemistry. And in terms of organic compounds, right now we're somewhere around 9 million different organic compounds. That's a crazy diversity of molecules. It's so much larger than all of the other chemistry put together. And that has to do with carbon's tetravalence and the fact that you can connect it to so many other different types of atoms in so many unique combinations. So organic chemistry is kind of a big deal because the molecules that we are made out of, the molecules that all living things are made out of, and a lot of the molecules that we use in our daily life, they're all based on carbon due to carbon's tetravalence. As we start to look at organic molecules, we're going to start with the simplest group of organic molecules, which are what are called the hydrocarbons. And you can probably tell from that name that these are molecules that are made out of just hydrogen and carbon put together. Hydrocarbons also happen to be the molecules that are most common in fossil fuels. So this is a diagram of an oil refinery, and you can see that crude oil, or what comes out of the ground in this case, is fed into a distillation apparatus. And by heating that crude oil mixture up to different temperatures, we can boil off the different components of the crude oil and we can get different things we can get things like diesel oil and fuel oil and the gasoline that runs all of the cars in our lives unless you're fortunate enough at this point to have an electric car so not only are hydrocarbons very very simple but they're also incredibly important for our lives as humans that live in a world that basically runs on hydrocarbons when looking at different types of hydrocarbons, we're going to break them out into two major groups. We've got our aromatic hydrocarbons. These have a ring structure, and benzene here is as good an example as any to stand in for that. And then we have our aliphatic hydrocarbons, where the hydrocarbons are just connected in a line. And I've got three different examples here, ethane, ethene, and ethine. And you can see in each case, those carbons are not connected in a ring. They're connected in a chain. 
You really don't have to pay too much to the aromatic hydrocarbons in our course. You can focus on those when you get to college level organic chemistry, but you absolutely do have to pay attention to the aliphatic hydrocarbons. As a matter of fact, you have a reference table that deals with the aliphatic hydrocarbons. So you can see we've got three different types, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, and we'll talk about each one in turn. You can probably see what the difference is already, but let's go through it. So we have what are called saturated hydrocarbons, and in a saturated hydrocarbon, the carbons are connected to each other only by single bonds. So every other bond that isn't from a carbon to a carbon in a saturated hydrocarbon is a carbon to a hydrogen. And then we have our unsaturated hydrocarbons where we have at least a double bond or a triple bond connecting our carbons and that's where this notion of an unsaturation comes from we could theoretically break those bonds and still add more hydrogens to this molecule to make it saturated the saturated hydrocarbons are called the alkanes and the unsaturated hydrocarbons are the alkenes if they have a double bond or the alkynes if they have a triple bond and so reference table q shows you three examples you've got ethane ethene and ethine which i showed you on the previous slide as well and these are what are called the homologous series of hydrocarbons. So the alkanes are all one homologous series, the alkenes are all another, and the alkynes are all a third. Another thing that's really interesting about the homologous series of hydrocarbons is that each one has a characteristic general formula. So if it's an alkane, you have some number of carbons, C to the N, and then some number of hydrogens represented as H to the 2N plus 2. So if our alkane had three carbons, it would have eight hydrogens. If you look at the alkenes, you can see that their general formula is C to the N, H to the 2N and the alkynes are C to the N, H to the 2N minus two. And we lose two additional hydrogens from each of those homologous series because of that double bond or the triple bond in the case of the alkynes. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. The other major reference table that's gonna be useful for hydrocarbons and in our introduction to organic chemistry more generally is the table of hydrocarbon prefixes, which are on reference table P. These prefixes are used for the number of carbons in the longest chain in the molecule. And we'll talk a lot more about what that means going forward. Notice that they're different from the covalent prefixes that we talked about back when we talked about covalent molecular formulas. It's not mono, di, tri, etc. It's meth, eth, prop, and you can see how it goes on from there. Let's take a look at some examples of how this works so we can kind of understand what's going on here. If we've got propane, propane is going to have three carbons in its longest chain, which is why it's got C3 written in its formula. And something like hexene is going to have six carbons because hex is the prefix that refers to six. You're absolutely going to need to be able to name aliphatic straight chain hydrocarbons. Here are the rules that we're going to follow. The first rule is that the number of carbons in the longest chain determines its prefix, and we can use reference table P to figure that out. The second rule is that the homologous series that the molecule belongs to, alkanes, alkenes, or alkynes, determines the suffix. Reference table Q will help us with that. So if we look at this molecule here, this is pentane. It's pentane because it has five carbons in its longest chain, and it ends in A-N-E because it's an alkane it has no double bonds or triple bonds between the carbons. Our third rule is that if there is a double or a triple bond, we're going to have to put a number in front of the molecule that tells us where the bond starts. And so we number our carbons so that the number one carbon is closest to that double bond or that triple bond. So here's an example of an alkene. This is 1-butene. And the reason it's 1-butene is because we always number our carbons so that the number one carbon is closest to the double bond or the triple bond if it were an alkyne. This makes the carbon all the way to the left the number one carbon, and since that double bond is between carbons one and two, it's one butene. That one means that the double bond starts on the first carbon. The only exception to rule number three are molecules that are three carbons or shorter in length. You don't need to number your carbons or put the number in the name in those cases because there's really only one place where you could put the double bond or the triple bond. Do these rules make sense? If they don't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we move on. Another common thing that we see in organic chemistry are molecules that are isomers of each other. Be careful with this vocabulary term because it sounds an awful lot like isotopes, but it's not. It's completely different. 
Isomers are molecules that have the same chemical formula, but that they have different structural formulas. So those atoms are put together in a fundamentally different way. We don't really see this until we get to molecules like butane. So here's butane, an alkane with four carbons. It's got the formula C4H10. And there is a structural isomer of butane. It's called methylpropane, or sometimes isobutane. And you can see it here. It's also got the same chemical formula, C4H10. But if you look at it, you can see that these carbons and hydrogens have been put together in a fundamentally different way. As we increase the number of carbons in the chain, we increase the number of isomers exponentially. The last thing that we're gonna talk about here in our introduction is how to draw organic molecules in class. We're gonna be doing a lot of that, so we have to have some conventions. There are a bunch of different ways to draw organic molecules. Here are three very common ways. We have expanded formulas, we have condensed formulas, and we have the skeletal structure. This is the same molecule represented in these three different manners. In the expanded formula, we show every carbon and hydrogen bonded to each other. In the condensed formula, we've now taken the atoms that surround the carbon and written them all together before we move on to the next carbon in the molecule. And in the skeletal structure, we remove all of that. And it's assumed that there is a carbon that has got as many hydrogens as it needs to have to have a full valence at every point in its diagram. Skeletal structures are going to be very common in college, but we're not going to use them in this class. In this class, we're only going to use expanded formulas and condensed formulas. And the reason we're going to do this is pretty simple. It's, it's hard enough to learn about organic chemistry without having to worry about learning how to represent a molecule in multiple different ways. Condensed formulas and expanded formulas are both fairly similar, and so it's not too hard. Skeletal structures are a little bit different and probably seem kind of weird to a new learner of chemistry. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of the introduction of organic chemistry. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can determine if a compound is organic or not. Also make sure that you can identify an organic compound as either aliphatic or aromatic. Make sure you can identify the aliphatic compounds as alkanes, alkenes, or alkynes. Make sure that you can name alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes that are made out of 10 or fewer carbons. And finally, make sure that you can represent organic molecules as both structural formulas and condensed structural formulas. If you can do all these things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video, and you can always get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.